All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson. My name is Eddie Watson, and this is ICU Advantage, giving you the confidence to succeed in the ICU by breaking down complex critical care subjects and making them easy to understand. If you'd be interested in more critical care content such as this video here, then please subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon though and select all notifications, that way you never miss out on a new lesson. And in this lesson here, we're gonna be talking about the different modes that are available to us on the defibrillator that we have at our disposal on our crash carts. It's really important to understand the differences between each of these modes, including when and why you'd wanna use each one. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. All right, when things are going bad for our patient, one of the first things that we grab is the crash cart. On it is one of our most important pieces of equipment in the ICU, the defibrillator. This device has so much life-saving potential, but only when you fully understand how to use it. While contrary to its name, it actually has three main functions or modes that it can operate in. And those are defibrillation, cardioversion, and pacing. I mean, I guess it technically has another mode too where we can just monitor our patients, but in terms of what it actually is doing, these are the three main modes. Now, while all of these modes use the same pads and make use of our friend electricity, they are quite different from one another, especially in the way that we use them for our patients. Before we talk about each of these modes, I do wanna cover some basic information. And the first of these is gonna be our electricity. And this is what really makes all the magic happen. You'll come across two different measures of electricity on the defibrillator. The first one is something called joules, and the other one is milliamps. A joule is essentially a measure of amps times voltage times some period of time. Well, amps or milliamps is just the current or one measure of how much electricity we're using. So while it's not important to really understand the difference between joules and amps, it is gonna be important to know that you will see these different measures on the defibrillator depending which mode you're in. So now let's talk about the delivery of the shock. And this is essentially how we get the electricity to our patient when needed. For these defibrillators, there's two main ways we can do this. We can either use paddles or we can use pads. Now many defibrillators have the paddles attached to the side of the device and they're really made famous by many movies and TV shows. And these are gonna be applied to the chest manually to deliver the shock. Now, in addition, in some circumstances, there are things called internal paddles that can be attached to the defibrillator and then used directly on the heart. The use of these require much less energy. Now for our pads, by far, these are the most commonly used device in the hospital these days as they're quite quick to place. In fact, they're often already attached to the defibrillator and all you need to do is put them on the patient. Proper and quick placement is gonna be key to the use of pads. And for that placement, there's really two main ways that we do this. We have the anterior posterior placement and the anterior apex placement. Now the anterior posterior is gonna be our preferred method of placement. One pad is placed on the anterior low chest in front of the heart, and the other pad is gonna be placed posteriorly behind the heart in between the scapula. And so you can see that over here, we have the one pad that's here in front of the heart, and then you're gonna have the other pad on the back side behind the heart. Now for the anterior apex, this approach can be used when the anterior posterior approach is either gonna be inconvenient or really unnecessary. One pad is gonna be placed on the patient's right upper chest below the clavicle, and the other pad is gonna be placed on the patient's left side, just below and to the left of the pectoral muscle or the breast for female patients. And so over here, you can see the one pad here on the patient's right side, again, below that clavicle, and then the other one on the patient's left side, on their side, down below the pectoral muscle. Now, one last thing real quick is it's important that you become comfortable with the setup and use of the, your particular machine. When you're using this, things are not going well for your patient usually. With the stress of the situation, the last thing you want is to be fumbling with the defibrillator and trying to remember how it is you're supposed to operate this. Take the time and play with it, put it in different modes, make changes to the settings, so this way that you're comfortable with it and when the time comes that you need to use it, that you're ready to go. All right, so let's talk about the different modes, starting with defibrillation, also referred to as defib. Now, defibrillation is the delivery of electrical energy measured here in joules to the heart to terminate lethal arrhythmias. 
Some of the energy that we deliver here is going to just go to the patient's body, but much of the energy delivered is actually going to go to and through the heart. Now it's this electricity going to the body, which is what's going to cause your patient to jolt when you shock them. But by delivering this current to the heart, this is going to cause the entire myocardium to depolarize at once. By causing the cells to enter this refractory period afterwards, the hope is that the SA node would take over as the heart's pacemaker again. Now we're only going to use defibrillation when our patient is in a lethal arrhythmia. And these are going to be our ventricular tachycardia or VTAC without a pulse and ventricular fibrillation or VFib, which is never going to have a pulse. Now remember though, we're never going to use this to shock either asystole or PEA. And remember, when your patient's in one of these rhythms that this is an emergency situation and early defibrillation is going to be the only treatment for them. Delivering this first shock should not be delayed. Now the steps to do this and defibrillate your patient quickly are going to be put the pads on the patient. Once you have those pads on, turn the defibrillator on into the defib mode. Press the charge button. Ensure everybody is clear and not touching the patient, and then deliver the shock. Now the shock here is going to be delivered immediately, regardless of at what point the patient is in that electrical cycle. Now once that shock has been delivered, current practices are to immediately begin chest compressions. Now when talking about defibrillators, you may have heard something kind of talking about the differences between monophasic and biphasic. Nowadays though, I think most hospitals are using the biphasic devices. The monophasic devices, which are at this point are really considered old technology, delivered electricity in one direction between the pads or paddles. Essentially, the electricity would flow from one pad over to the other. The biphasic device, which I'm sure you probably can figure out now, actually delivers the electricity one way, then switches directions and goes the other way. And it's this biphasic delivery that's going to allow for lower energy requirements. And this is going to primarily help to prevent burns as well as injury to the myocardium. And to really showcase this, the, the maximum energy that we use for monophasic is actually 360 joules, while for biphasic, the maximum amount is only 200 joules. And really the studies have shown that by using the biphasic approach, you can use much less energy and actually deliver a higher chance of first shock success. Now on the subject of the energy delivery, again, like I talked about, current recommendations are to deliver the shock and then immediately resume chest compressions. In the past, it used to be this stacking of successive shocks and then beginning CPR, but they found that that's entirely too much time to not be delivering compressions and thus perfusion to our patient. That said, the current recommended energy steps for the initial and then each successive shock for adults are going to be starting at 120 joules, then going to 150 joules, and then finally hitting 200 joules. And then once you reach 200 joules for any successive shocks after that, you're just going to continue with 200. Now I should clarify though that these joules are for using external pads or paddles. Uh, if you are using internal defibrillation, we're going to be using much less energy for this. Here we're going to start at 5 joules, then go to 10 joules, 20 joules, 30 joules, and then finally 50 joules. And again, just stay at 50 if you reach that point. Alright, so with defibrillation out of the way, let's actually talk about cardioversion, also known as synchronized cardioversion. Now, synchronized cardioversion is going to be similar to defibrillation with a couple main differences. Synchronized cardioversion is the delivery of electrical energy, again measured in joules, to the heart to terminate tachyarrhythmias. Here, your patient is often awake prior to this. And the use of cardioversion is not always in a medical emergency. And this will make more sense when we talk about the arrhythmias that we're going to treat with this. And these are going to be things like atrial tachycardia or SVT, atrial fibrillation or AFib, or atrial flutter or A flutter. As you can see from these arrhythmias, these aren't necessarily medical emergencies, but the synchronized cardioversion is able to shock the patients out of these tachyarrhythmias potentially. Now, in addition to these, we're also going to use synchronized cardioversion for ventricular tachycardia, so again our VTAC, this time with a pulse. So here this is going to be different than defibrillation because the patient still has a pulse. Now for our stable patients, they're going to be treated with medication, while our unstable patients, so those who are dropping their blood pressure, uh, starting to lose consciousness, as long as they still have a pulse, they're going to receive synchronized cardioversion. 
Now, the big main difference with synchronized cardioversion and defibrillation is that with our cardioversion, as the name suggests, we're going to be synchronizing with the patient's heart rhythm, specifically to the R wave. So here, by syncing with the R wave, that this is going to ensure that the shock is not delivered during the T wave, which is going to impact repolarization and really risk the heart going into a lethal arrhythmia like ventricular fibrillation. You definitely don't want that going on when you were potentially just dealing with a non-emergency situation. Now, the steps that you're going to want to go through here are, again, once the pads are attached to the patient, you want to turn it on into defib mode. Once there, you want to make sure and select the synchronize option. And this is where you should actually see dots above each R wave showing that the defibrillator is recognizing and syncing to the patient's rhythm. From here, press the charge button. And then once you're ready to deliver the shock and everybody is clear, press the shock button. Now, one caveat here to synchronize cardioversion is you're actually going to have to hold the shock button. And this is going to be because a shock may not be immediately delivered as the defibrillator is going to be waiting to deliver that shock in sync with the patient's R wave. Again, this is different from defibrillation when the shock is going to be delivered at any point during the cardiac cycle. And this is also why defibrillation is sometimes called asynchronous cardioversion. So again, the key here is that it's going to deliver that shock on the R wave to avoid landing on the T wave. Now, once you've given the shock to the patient, you want to evaluate the rhythm and really check and see if they've converted out of that tachyarrhythmia that they were in before. Now, another difference with synchronized cardioversion is going to be the energy that is delivered. For cardioversion, we're often using less energy, typically starting with 50 to 100 joules for adults. Now, one other big difference compared to defibrillation is because here, your patient's actually going to oftentimes be awake and getting shock really hurts. So if possible, sedation should really be used prior to delivering the shock. And here I say if possible because depending why you're doing the cardioversion, if it's something like a fib, you probably have time and your patient would be okay to give them sedation prior. Whereas if your patient has gone into VTAC but they still have a pulse, but they're beginning to lose consciousness, you're going to need to get them shocked out quickly and you're probably not going to have time to give them sedation. Again, big difference when they are VTAC without a pulse, they're not with us anymore, they don't need sedation, they're not going to feel this. All right, and so on to the final mode, and that's going to be our pacing. Now, I'm not going to go too in-depth into pacing in general here, as I actually have another lesson that's going to be coming up that's going to cover this topic in much more detail. But here for this lesson, we're just going to be talking about transcutaneous pacing via the defibrillator. And transcutaneously here means we're going to be giving these shocks through the skin via the pads on the patient. So in this mode, we're going to be delivering electrical energy, this time measured in milliamps, to cause cardiac muscle contraction. Now here we're going to be using pacing when our patients are bradycardic, and this also includes our second and third degree blocks, and when our patient is symptomatic. And just as with the synchronized cardioversion, analgesia or sedation should be used to help with patient discomfort here. Now, it's important to know that transcutaneous pacing should really only be a temporary measure until a more, I'm going to put this in air quotes, permanent solution can be put in place. Now, this more permanent solution could be an actual pacemaker implanted or even something like a transvenous pacemaker, which is going to be a little bit more long-term solution and definitely more comfortable for the patient. Now, typically when we were talking about our defibrillation and our synchronized cardioversion, we were able to monitor the patient's heart rhythm via the two pads that we had on them. We technically lose that monitoring during the brief period of time that the shock is delivered, but then once that's done, we're able to switch back to monitoring through those pads. But now, because we're going to be repeatedly delivering shocks via those pads, you're actually going to need a separate three-lead cable. Now, one of the nice things is that some pads and some defibrillators actually have that built into one of the pads, so you actually don't have to get a, a whole nother set of cables and, and three leads attached to your patient. But regardless, whether it's through that all-in-one pad or through this separate set of cables, we're going to have to be able to monitor the patient's rhythm separately from the electrodes that we're using to give the pacing shocks. Now, the steps to go through and do this pacing is actually a little bit more involved than even the synchronized cardioversion. First, you're going to have to attach the pads and the three lead if not already built into the pads. And here, when attaching the pads, the anterior posterior is going to be the best method for this. 
I actually remember years ago when we had pads on a patient, uh, he was a larger guy and we had it set up in the anterior apex and we had the output completely cranked up on this and we still could not get any kind of capture. As soon as we switched to the anterior posterior, then we were able to bring that output way down and actually still get capture for this guy. Now, once the pads and three leads are on, you're gonna to wanna to turn the defibrillator on by putting it into pacer mode. Now, you also wanna just confirm that the leads that you're monitoring are not set to the pads and they're actually set to uh, one of the leads on the three lead. Now we wanna set the, the rate of our desired pacing. And this is essentially gonna be the heart rate that we want for our patient. Then once we have that set, we're gonna to wanna to increase the output or the milliamps until you have capture. Now, the way that capture is defined is going to be that you're going to see a pacing spike and it's going to be immediately followed typically by a wide QRS complex for every pacing spike that's seen. And so here in this example here, you can see each one of those pacing spikes going down below and then they're immediately followed by a wide QRS. Now, when we're increasing the output, the increases are usually going to be uh, by 5 milliamps at a time and will go as high as like 140 milliamps. Typically, when we're cranking this up, we're actually going to overshoot the milliamps that are required to achieve capture in our patient. So once you achieve capture, then you want to slowly decrease the milliamps until you're at the minimum level for capture. This is going to be what we call the patient's milliamp threshold. Once we've determined what this threshold is, then you actually want to increase your milliamps by another 10% above this threshold. And the whole point of this is we want the least amount of electricity in order to achieve capture, but we also want to build in a little bit of a buffer to ensure that we aren't going to not capture if there's any changes in position or physiology that might impact the ability of that electrical signal to meet that threshold point. At this point, your patient should be pacing. We've got the rate set. We've got them dialed in to capture with our output. And this is where finally we want to set the mode of the pacing. And this is going to be with either asynchronous or demand pacing. Asynchronous mode basically just delivers the shock at the specific rate that you have set, really regardless of what the patient's rhythm is doing underneath. On the flip side, in the demand mode, the defibrillator is actually only going to deliver the pacing shocks when the patient's heart rate is below the set rate on the machine. So it's going to continue to watch the patient's rhythm. If things slow down below whatever you have it set at, it's going to begin pacing until the patient's heart rate comes back up above that rate that's set. So again, we talked about a lot of things here. So the steps here, attach the pads in the three lead, turn it on into pacer mode, set your rate of pacing, increase your output until you get capture, dial it back to hit your threshold, and then increase it by 10% and then finally set your mode either asynchronous or demand. All right, so that is the shocking truth, and those are the three modes of the defibrillator that we use that are on our crash cart to help us in emergency situations. Hopefully going over this stuff gave you guys a little bit better understanding of what the differences are between these modes and the when and why you would actually be using it. And again, most importantly, it's really important that you guys feel comfortable with setting this up and operating it in each of these modes because most of the time that you're doing this, you're gonna be under a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. So make sure you take that time to, to really have a good grasp of what you're doing. All right, well, I hope you guys really enjoyed this lesson. If you did, please go down below, leave me a like. It really goes a long way to help support this channel, as well as leave me any comments or questions that you have. I love reading and responding to, to all the comments that you guys leave for me. A special shout out to the amazing YouTube members and Patreon members out there. You guys are willing to show additional support for this channel, which is really going to allow me to do a lot of good things coming up here soon in the future. But in addition to showing that support, you also get additional perks that aren't available to just watching the videos here on YouTube. And so a big thank you to you guys. I really appreciate all that you guys do. If you'd be interested in showing additional support, you can join the channel membership down below or head on over to Patreon and check out some of the perks that we have available to you. Another way to show support is to check out some of the merch and the t-shirts that I have down below. Uh, all that goes directly towards support supporting this channel as well. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and stay tuned for the, the next lesson that I'm going to release. In the meantime, check out a couple really awesome videos that I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.